today. Um, you know, our mothers came from a generation or they, our grandmothers came from a generation where the idea of sacrifice was, uh, you know, preeminent, where, uh, especially if it was a woman, the idea of sacrifice uh, was, uh, you know, you sacrificed for your husband, you sacrificed for your family, for your parents, you sacrificed for your in-laws, your kids, especially your children. Um, and that was something that was celebrated. But in my lifetime, I have seen how that whole thing has seen a reversal. Today, uh, the idea of sacrifice, especially woman sacrificing, why should you? So the whole thing is why? Why must a woman sacrifice? As if, if even if it were her choice, if let's say today a woman chooses to sacrifice and somehow she's lampooned for that very choice. So a sacrifice, um, and I, I don't mean sacrifice in a very, uh, uh, you know, um, in its most cliched uh, sense of the word, but I mean sacrifice in the idea of sacrifice, uh, that I give myself up or I put myself on hold or on the back burner for someone else. Um, so that um, I think has changed and seen, I mean, today it's not a quality that is, uh, you know, applauded at all. Um, so my question to you is, um, what do you think of this? And you've spoken about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, in, in today's idea of love has, has changed um, quite a bit. Uh, the modern idea of love is not what it used to be, especially the Hindu love stories that you talk about in your book. There is a vast difference. Um, so in today's environment where everything is so focused on uh, instant gratification and self-gratification. Um, how do you explain to people concepts like Vipra Lamba Shingara, for example, that uh, because love in, in people's mind is only about being together. If you can't, and, and I think your case, uh, I think it should be the rate. <laughs> so if you could speak a little bit about how do you explain something like that? Why, how can there be joy in separation? Yes. Um, the fundamental problem is that we have this duality of you versus me or me versus the world. And now what, what we describe as love has become about this bartering or this negotiation almost. So it's because if, if love is something I want from you, I have this desire and you're going to satisfy my desire for company or for you know whatever it is then um, there's always a sense, okay, I want something from you and you want something from me. So transactionally, we're, you know, that's why we're, we're coming together. And yeah. as long as I'm getting that from you, then, then the relationship is good. But we know that all enjoyment ends, that that desire will pass, something else will, will replace it. And then it becomes transactional means it'll, it'll break. There's this misconception of sacrifice as something that we give up of ourselves or it's a reduction of ourselves i'm giving I'm, you're taking from i'm taking from me to give it to you and so therefore i'm reduced this is a very bizarre and, and wrong conception so like in the bhagavad gita in the 13th chapter there's an entire um passage of verses that talk about sacrifice um, so the very foundation of Srishtiya creation is based on sacrifice. The, the cycle of life is sustained through, through sacrifice. Um, in that sense, you can understand sacrifice as being like, you know, yagya and making the offerings into the sacrificial fire. Where, again, you, what you offer doesn't take away from you because in nourishing the cycle of life, which includes all of the, all the sentient beings, all of the universe, then we ourselves are blessed also. It's not that I'm sacrificing for the devas. It's like I'm sacrificing because through that, the devas will be nourished and then the rains will come. And this, the whole thing is based on, on yeah. sacrifice. And in that, I'm also included. Mm -hmm. um, this, this notion is, has been completely uh, taken away. Um, sacrifice in, in that sense isn't giving up as much as it is in an offering for the whole. And then when you're part of the whole, you are also um, blessed by that. And it actually, what you find again in these love stories, it's in, in the Western sense, when we think of love, we think, oh, if someone is loved, then they're great. Like if someone loves me, there must be something wonderful about me. In the Tarmic framework, you focus on the one who is loving or the lover, right? So how much are you able to love? How much of yourself are you able to, to devote to someone else's well-being, not because of your own attachments or your addiction to them, but because of their own, that selfless sense. 
And that actually ennobles the, the lover. It's not about the beloved, it's, it's actually a quality. It's an expression of the qualities and the values that you yourself have. So that's the more you can spiritualize and heighten the love, the better that you are. It becomes like a sadhana in, in, in that respect. And so that idea of, of sacrifice it's something that, you know, if, if it's something like, like, like Parvachot, right? Yes, you are fasting because, you know, for your husband's well-being and, and, and things, things like that. But that's not a taking away from yourself because in doing that, that in and of itself is your own sadhana, it's your own spiritual path. And what our rishis and acharyas understood are that women are naturally um, invested in relationships. They're very, you know, their identity is much more based on relationships, relatively speaking, than, than men, for example. So the more that you can spiritualize that, the more that you can make those relationships conducive to a woman's development and her path towards moksha, the, the better it is. So you, you start from that psychology and then you, you're addressing that. And, uh, and this has all been very misunderstood and made into this very zero sum type of game. And the really bad thing is when you start thinking of like that, you're never going to want to do something to make someone else happy. And, and it's, it's just this, this entitlement. So it's like, it's, it's neither will it make you happy. What am I nor will it make the other person. Happy. Yeah, exactly. Versus what can I do to make someone else happy? And, you know, and this isn't like a karmic thing, even like Western psych psychological studies find this, that when you're thinking of the team or when you're thinking of others, you actually feel much more fulfilled and contented than when you're only thinking of yourself. This is, research shows this. Um, and then that goes to your point about, about separation. Um, so, um, you know, there is in, in the Pakti tradition, there is a sense of this, this pava of um, vipralamba or, or separation or feeling love through separation. That is a very elevated, exalted rasa or, or, or pava, which most of us don't have the adhikara to really necessarily practice that. You know, like uh, Radharani has this, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has that, but we should we should know that it's that it's there, and uh, we should we should revere it. But what we can bring of that into our lives is um, understanding that love isn't about you know physical presence or, or, or company but when you think of love as love as being part of sadhana um then you're able to practice that even in, in periods of separation right so um and 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 this kind of this idea of this of this bond i think there's also something in, in modern relationships where there's just a fear if i'm not with someone they're going to forget about me they may move on to someone else and things like that and that's Again, when love is part of your duty or part of your dharma, and you can, you know, it, it's considered a bad thing to be able to take someone for granted. Yeah. But actually, it's a very great thing if, if you're able to know that someone's always going to be there for you or you're always going to be there for someone. There's no better, you know, comfort or security in, 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 in the world. And so that when you have that separation, even there, it's enough just to know that the other person exists or that they care for you or, or, or that, you know, just, just knowing that that person exists, like that, that's enough. And you don't have to measure it by, you know, how, how much you're, you know, how many times you call each other or how many, you know, because you just know. Um, and, and, and that is something we can definitely apply to our lives practically. So, so that's something, you know, that I've, I've done in my, in, in my own case. Which is not to see, um, see, if, if you think of something that I'm, I'm entitled to this and then the past two years, I, my husband should have been with me or I should have been with him. And that's something that's been taken away from me. You'll always be miserable because there's always something more in life that you would have wanted. I think if you limit yourself to always about your, you know, is this constant self-identification with every situation, it's always going to fall short of your expectations, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm just adding to what we just said. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. And so, you know, when, if you're getting married, um, it depends, you know, if your mindset when you're getting married is that this is going to be my partner in dharma, and we are going to pursue our, our purushartha together. And we don't know what'll, what'll come or, you know, what's our destiny. We, we didn't know in 2019 that this pandemic would be coming, but this is the person that I choose as my partner and, and we're going to face life together then that's much, uh, that's, that's, that's healthier. And that's, you know, then you won't feel unfulfilled versus um, if, if you pursue love out of neediness 
and the sense that, you know, I need someone, you know, with me or I'm loneliness, then, then there's always going to be this, this, this danger and this inability to really, you, you can't have a relationship with someone else until you have like a healthy, uh, until you yourself are, are, are healthy. I think that's a, that's a fundamental, uh, that's a fundamental point. Um, but actually there is one thing I wanted to bring up in, in that context. So um, there's uh, one of the, the rites that happens in, in some weddings in different parts of India is called the, the Kashi Yatra, uh, Kashi Yatra mm, yeah. Prayoga. And basically it's, it's before the wedding begins um, and, uh, and, and the groom is um, you know, preparing to go on, on, on Kashi Yatra. So Kashi, Kashi is, of course, like the, the sacred abode of Shiva. It's the most sacred city for, for Hindus. It's a center of learning. And then the bride's father comes to him and says, I know you, you're going on this Yatra, but please consider, you know, this, this woman, my, my daughter, uh, to, be your, to take her as your, as your bride, to be your partner, and then you, may you pursue Purushartha together. Uh, Kashi Yatra also symbolizes celibacy, that he is going yes. to allow celibacy. Yes. And so, um, you know, the, the importance of the Grihastha Ashrama or the, the, the family life. And, uh, and then may, she, you know, may you be partners together in, in pursuing Dharma. So there are different ways you can understand that. One is, I think nowadays we kind of think of it, oh, it's like, it's almost like kind of like a, like, like a joke or like, oh, he's, yeah. he's going and the bride's family catches him and brings funny. him back. <laughs> But, but actually it's, it's not just like a, a play acting. It's not just like this, uh, this merriment. It's, it's actually much deeper than that because at the time when you have the wedding, the samskaras are very strong from that. So when the rites are performed in accordance with the, with the Shasta, it, it leaves a deep impress on both the, the minds of the bride and the groom. And for years and decades, it'll, it'll carry them through. And what the Kashiata reminds us is the, the ultimate aim is you know, and that sounds Kashi or, or metaphorized by, by Kashi. It's just that you can go there, you know, like like through the Nivriti route, through the celibacy, or you can go there as a, through the Grihastha Ashrama. And, and that's what, it, it's not so much that you're abandoning Kashi Yatra, mm -hmm. so now to become a householder and be in Grihastha Ashrama. It's that through Grihastha Ashrama, through this life, this family life together, we'll together proceed towards, uh, yeah, towards yeah, Kashi. Yeah, you Yes. Kashi. Right. And I think what's important is because then you always remember, even just subconsciously, the impress is there that yes, our ultimate goal, our ultimate yeah. destination is moksha, is, is, is the spiritual path. And then that really gives you the titiksha or the forbearance and the, you know, the ability to get through kind of these hard times that come for every, every couple, because you know what the ultimate goal is. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad, Namaskar.